although seniors make me feel as old as I actually am. Um, and the only correction is um, uh, this Petroleum Market Advisory Committee, one of my great successes in the last month is successfully convincing the California Energy Commission to make Severin Borenstein the chair instead of me. And so I'm released from that duty now. <laughs> um, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, talk about energy efficiency, more about the past. A lot of what we've been hearing all day, today and yesterday, is about the future, what we can do. And I'm really interested in what we can do, but I think one of the things that's useful to do is to see what we have done in shaping the energy system. Amory started with uh, a few comments at the beginning of his session, uh, at the beginning in his talk, talking a little bit about the past. Um, the things I'm going to talk about are actually completely consistent, but, but just go more broadly looking backwards instead of looking, looking forwards. And why do, you, why do I do it? I think actually in understand, I mean, I'm interested in energy modeling, pro projecting the impacts of policy. To do that, it's really good to understand what's actually worked and what hasn't worked. And, and to do it quantitatively rather than just, just in, in uh, numbers. So, we start with what I like to think, start with what I call the energy policy triangle. The notion that, that in the United States, and around the world really, um, if we think about energy policy, we really have to think about the three things Secretary Schultz talked about. The economy, the security, and the environment. And they really interplay absolutely within the energy area. So if you could think about energy efficiency, the environment, you know, the cleanest energy is the energy you never have to use in the first place. Security, uh, I'll talk about energy efficiency as having been probably more important, had been more important in reducing our imports of oil, or imports of energy, than Fracking for natural gas, for oil, for wind, solar, nuclear, hydropower, together. That energy efficiencies had more of an impact than all of those together in reducing our imports. And the economy, um, the uh, economic reductions from good energy efficiency is good for the economy. So I want to be careful about get a definition because we have a lot of people who are from engineering and physics definition uh, backgrounds. Energy efficiency word can be used in a number of different ways, and I'm using it in a particular way. Um, a definition that will include anything that I would you think of as an economically efficient reduction in energy use. So if you tell a commute, commute to work, I call that energy efficiency if you get the, if you still work of effectively, if you change your mode of transport so you use less energy, I'll call that energy efficiency. Different from the physics definition that we heard from Chris Edwards here, which was the amount of energy used to accomplish the same end. That definition is perfectly appropriate, but it's too narrow a definition for the uh, policy things I'm talking about. When we get into energy, I want to start with the, uh, I'm calling this the, the good, the bad, the reality. Well, that was the good, all the good things that we can do with energy. The bad is there's been a lot of attention showing that there's barriers to uh, the use of energy, uh, uh, to the more, most efficient use of energy. Um, those barriers we could summarize in this table here. I'm not going to spend much time on the, bar on the barriers, although um, there's been a lot written on that, and I'd be happy to go back to those. But there's institutional barriers, market failures, behavioral issues. I, that's the bad. The bad is we're not getting as much as we could and should be getting. But you can turn that around. If you're not getting as much as you could or should be getting, that means there will be opportunities in the future to get more. And we talked about a lot of those at the beginning of, 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 of the talk. Um, 
but I want to talk about what, what the effect has been. And these, I want you to just read these words, because these are summaries, and I'm going to build it down. First, energy efficiency has been more important than shaping the U.S. supply and demand balance and carbon dioxide emissions since the energy crisis in 73 than all of the other supply options put together. Second, most of them have been in invisible to outsiders and often to insiders. It's a, we'll, I'll be talking about a cumulative process of small changes broadly distributed around the whole United States actually around the world, but I'll only focus on the United States, with a lot of things that have generally not been recognized unless you're paying attention, and that have cumulatively led to the big effect. So to do this, I have to go back in history. The use of energy um, prior to the energy crisis in 1973, and I'm not sure how I can very effectively do this, but if you look at the top blue line, that, that, that tells you the total amount of energy use. It's growing in lockstep with the economy, growing about a half a percentage point less rapidly than the economy, and that half a percent is just general productivity growth in the economy. The black was the domestic production of fossil fuels. The green, the, the purple, you see the purple in there? No, well, that was nuclear power. And the green was renewables. And those renewables were almost entirely hydropower and secondarily uh, wood. Uh, and the gray was imports. And at that time, imports of energy had tripled over the last three years. And then all of a sudden, there's an energy crisis. Where, where, where there was an embargo against the United States, the price of oil tripled, and was a shot across the bow. But before that, energy, the important thing I want to focus on, energy growing along with the economy. And the way you can look at that is look at the energy intensity of the economy. How much energy is used per dollar of GDP, adjusted for inflation, of course. Um, and you can look at this trend here from 19, uh, 1950 to 1973, some wiggles up and down, but that's really been about um, half of a percent a year reduction in energy per unit of GDP. Um, I take that as, the ener as a no energy efficiency benchmark because at this time, People, before this time, people were not paying much attention at all to energy. Uh, as the company expanded, it expanded the use of everything. It, there was no big signal to say, ah, be special about efficient in your use of energy. It was just like any other input. So nobody paid any attention. So that's what I take as the energy, of, no energy efficiency benchmark. The historical trends, which I have, uh, going back to 1950, actually you can go back to 19, about 1930 and see about this half of a percent per year reduction as this grew lockstep with the economy. Then the crude oil prices uh, skyrocketed in 1973. I've got this in real and nominal dollars. Um, gasoline lines. People were quite scared, but at this time, you can document what people believed the energy efficiency was going to be doing, was going to happen in the United States, or how much energy consumption. Uh, these, are for, oops, these are forecasts from the U.S. Federal Energy Administration, the Project Independence Report, Project Independence brought to us by Nixon while he was there, and then finished off by Ford, who was there a longer time. Um, Notice that the, at that time, the, both the National P Petroleum Council and the academic studies were believing that the, the use of energy would increase pretty significantly over the time period that they were projecting. If you follow this no energy efficiency benchmark, that is half a percent per year less rapid than the growth of the economy, 
you'd have this uh, consumption of energy going up to 180 quads by, by the year 2014. Um, that's what I'm taking as a no energy efficiency benchmark for the reasons I described uh, above. Um, here's where the forecasts were. The forecasts were actually a little bit higher growth rate than, than we saw at that time. So what happened? First, there was a policy response. The federal government created a group of agencies. In the US, there was Energy Research and Development Administration. There was the Federal Energy Administration internationally. There was the International Energy Agency. And the federal, and the federal government at that time adopted really an all of the above strategy. They said, there's several things that you can do. One, you could do nothing, and that was a benchmark in which uh, people, the government rejected. You could accelerate supply. You could, ex what they call conservation, which we would now call an energy efficiency, efficiency strategy, and emergency preparedness. And then they said, um, it'll be a mix of this. It'll be all of the above uh, for successful. Even more significant was what the private sector started doing. Uh, cost became, of energy became an important factor in innovation in companies. Not the only factor, but it's an important factor as in the past when it wasn't an important factor. So innovation started including ways of moving away from energy. Energy saving technologies and practices started getting created to reduce the use of energy. Capital investment changed, uh, and even management changed. I'll give some examples of changing in management. This is the actual path of energy consumption over time, which we can compare with what we would have done with our energy efficiency. And I, I understand, Amory uh, told me that he gave, showed a similar sort of graph um, in his talk. And I view that that's a measure of energy efficiency. It's been worth about about 80 quads of, of energy that you don't need in the first place, and therefore, you know, the cleanest possible, possible energy. That's the aggregate. Notice uh, recently, the more recent trends from the year 2000 till 2015, uh, there's no increase in the energy use, even though the economy grew 28% in that time. Some people will describe this as, it's, that, that the energy system is decoupled from the overall economy, that's totally wrong concept. Because if any industry expands, they use more of everything, including more energy. If, if the economy uh, goes up and down, use of energy goes up and down. What's been happening is the rate of energy intensity reduction of the overall economy has been roughly at the rate at which the economy is growing. So two very different forces have been roughly balancing out. So on net, we're not increasing the use of energy uh, on a year-by-year -year basis. If you look at this in, in um, energy intensity, energy use per dollar of GDP, you could think of this as the before the energy crisis. and. This was, there was no policy, no price response, totally laissez-faire in the energy area, and we had a reduction of about half a percent a year. The oil prices went up rapidly, and they stayed high until 1985, when the oil prices plummeted. We created many energy policies at the federal level. There was much attention to energy, a lot of innovation in that area. The reductions were about 2.7% per year. Oil prices dropped in 1985, and then since that time, the, the decline of energy intensity is 1.7% a year. You can say, well, less than 3%, small numbers. But I view it like watching a child grow. Week by week, they don't grow at all, and all of a sudden, they approach you and said, you know what, I got to pay college tuition. You said, boy, they've got an awful big all of a sudden. So if you look at this, uh, the, we, we used 14,000 BTUs for 2009 dollar of GDP in 1973. Nine, in 2014, we used six. To me, that's a tremendous change. <laughs> 
in, in the energy use. And notice that, that, that we really did have, a, have a very different between what I view as three different regimes. Pre-crisis, where we didn't do anything, and it limped along. High prices and high government policy working together, there was a rapid change. Then when the prices went down, we backed away from federal and state, state policies to a large extent. They were still there, but not nearly as much, and we had smaller reduction. Okay, let's talk about the other side of the policy that was a, a determined by the federal government, energy production. We can look at the domestic energy production here. Notice the scale is, is somewhat different. Um, so we have a scale of the maximum is 90 quadrillion BTUs. And you notice that that little, that red, red up at the top, that's wind, and then brown and yellow above that is, is uh, geothermal and solar. They're growing rapidly in percentage terms, but they're very small. What's the big thing that's happened recently is the purple, that's nuclear power, is, is now is about 8% of the supply of energy. And recently, natural gas and natural gas pushing out coal. So those have been the big effects um, in the energy system. So let's put this all together in the US energy system, we got the energy efficiency impacts. You see down there the, the role of the supply increases, and the gray is the imports. We've now been down to a point where we've, we've reduced our, our imports of energy down to what we were in 1973. You've all seen the advertisements probably that US is, the, US is now the new energy power in the world. That's, that's it. If I gotta, I've got to go down here. <laughs> that's this growth in fossil fuels is the, is, is, is the, is the dominant thing they're talking about. Um, nuclear actually is, is, is uh, almost as big a deal in that. And then energy efficiency is where, is where most of the action really is. So that when we say we're, we're no longer importing any more energy that we would, we've done in the past, we're getting almost self-sufficient, and we say it's because of the additional supplies of oil and gas. Yeah, it is. Once we had the energy efficiency, those, those smaller elements is what pushed us over. Um, let's go back to the environment and decarbonization. The way we clean up the environment is using less energy um, per unit of GDP and less carbon per unit of energy. So if you look at the carbon intensity of the economy, it's a product of two things. Energy per unit of GDP and carbon per unit of energy. So this is the carbon per unit of energy that we have. Uh, you don't see quite, it's decarbonized. Um, this is moved from about 63 million uh, metric tons per quad down to about 55. So we've had a little decarbonization of the, of the energy system. Uh, so if you put these together, said, okay, let's think about the uh, decarbonization of the U.S. economy and use what we call a Kaya identity we can say carbon dioxide per unit of GDP is energy use per unit of GDP times carbon dioxide per energy use. So I said a moment ago, those are the three factors. So you can think about the international negotiations. We're coming up in Paris. No country of the world is saying, I'm going to reduce carbon dioxide by, by stopping my economy from growing. They're saying, well, we want to keep growing, but they're saying, we'll decarbonize our energy system by solar and wind, and we'll have more energy intensity, a less energy intense economy. So we can sort of look at the effects over time of these three factors. This, the, we start everything with a unit of one to show the effect. The green is the reduction in the energy intensity of the economy. That's hard data. There's no judgment in terms of that. 
I break this down into that blue, which is the normal productivity trends of the economy. I don't call that energy efficiency. It's just what would have happened anyway in the past. And, and that, that next graph, which is the energy efficiency. So those lead to the blue line. Then we have, have the black. This is a decarbonization of the energy system. So these become multiplicative. You multiply the percentage of, of, of those two factors to get the total thing, the, energy, the, uh, the carbon dioxide uh, intensity of the economy. Again, if, so if you look at this, not the future. This is the past. Where the action really has been, it's been energy intensity as of hard, just hard numbers. And I call two thirds of that energy efficiency for the reasons I've talked about. It is the deliberate changes in, in reduce the use of energy. And about a third of those is productivity. Um, how is this related to other countries? Here we have a few of the countries, China, India, Germany, uh, UK, Japan, and France. Those are carbon dioxide intensity trends. I only go back to 1980 here. Um, where did those trends come from? Well, that's energy intensity trends of those same countries. And here's carbon dioxide intensity trends. The only, it's only France that has been, been reduce their energy and carbon dioxide intensity of the energy system much, and that's because of their heavy dominance on nuclear power. So France has done, so again, the story I'm telling about the United States, where most of the decarbonization is energy intensity, relatively little is on the supply side. It's a story around the world. It's just, uh, I've got better data for the US. How about energy imports? Well, again, you have to choose a benchmark. And I take the benchmark, what if there have been no changes in energy supply at all since 1973 of any types, and there have been no change in energy intensity, uh, no change in energy efficiency of the economy. We still had the normal productivity trends, but no change in energy intensity. How much imports would we have? That's the red line. The black line is how much imports we actually have as we have become secure because we've become much more, much, we're not dependent upon foreign sources, particularly from the Middle East or other friendly countries like Venezuela uh, for supplying our oil or energy. Uh, so you can ask, well, can we decompose that? The blue is the energy efficiency, the, the changes in energy intensity. The black is changes the energy supply. That brown, uh, that brown is the change in fossil fuel. That's oil and gas fracking minus the reduction in coal. So that's really the change in the fossil fuels. So you see, for energy imports, a situation of, of energy security. Uh, now, I want to, because I'm running, uh, boy, this clock must be wrong. It says I'm almost out of time. OK, where did this happen over the whole economy? These, these are four sectors. The industrial sector responded very, very quickly. Some of it was changing, changing the mix of, of, of Production. Some of it was was the um, energy efficiency. In recent years, this is about 2002, 2003. It was competition with China, but starting 1973, competition with China wasn't a big deal. It's only in recent years. Industrial sector, um, transportation sector, residential sector and commercial sector, all have broken those same trends. Um, 
industrial production, some people say it's because industrial production collapsed in the United States. Nah, that's not true. The black is the index of industrial production in the United States. It's continued to grow. We've changed the products that we're making in the United States and how we make the products. Um, give you some examples. Energy intensity of, of the commercial airlines, the certificated air carriers. In 1973, um, domestic or international operations, it was 10 or 11,000 BTUs per passenger mile. In, 2000, in 2012, the last data we ha have, it's either, it's in the order of three, three and a half thousand BTUs per passenger mile. So this per mile we travel on airlines has gone down by a factor of roughly three or four. Um, Government buildings, the um, size of the amount of square foot of government facilities hasn't changed very much. The energy intensity in terms of 1,000 BTUs per square foot went from about 200 to 120 in that time period. Is this, all the data is in terms of primary energy, so you can say, well, it's because electric utilities became more efficient. No, that's not true. The black line is the uh, heat, average heat rate for electricity generation. They did get a little bit more efficient, but not a lot more. So this has been mostly end use efficiency that I've been talking about. So some examples, the lighting revolution, both the type of what lights we have from CFLs to now LEDs, and there's new generations that'll come after LEDs, but I'm just talking about the past. Motion light sensing switches so the lights aren't always on when, when, you, when you leave the room. We've, uh, the ballast for fluorescent lights have moved from, from magnetic ballast to electronic ballast. Why that's significant is you, magnetic, you've got to do it at 60 cycle, Electronic, you can use it thousands of cycles per second, and that gives you much more efficient uh, use of your fluorescent tubes. Refrigerators move from about 2,000 BTUs, uh, 2,000 kilowatt hours per year, down to about 375, while refrigerators on the average got bigger and cheaper. Fuel economy, in 1973, cars got 12 and a half miles per gallon. That's eight gallons per 100 miles of driving. Now on the average, you, get, you take four gallons of gasoline for the same 100 miles of, dra of traveling, cut in half. Um, cars and trucks, this, this cars and trucks individually move more rapidly. We move a mix of cars versus trucks has changed. We have more SUVs. But the bottom line is we've cut in half the fuel use per mile of driving. Is this because these became wimpy cars? No, the performance has gotten better. What's different if you look at pictures of the cars, the interior space of the cars hasn't changed. The front end and the back end have both in terms of the size, the weight, the 73, if you look, think about the uh, air flows, that's turbulent flow. This is definition of creating turbulent flow. The uh, others, we got laminar flow in there. Um, aircraft, this is the engines, fuel economy using an index of 100 study in 1960. The engine fuel economy has gone, uh, uh, and energy use per standardized engine improved 40%. Aircraft fuel burn per seat went down to 30% of what it was in 1960. Um, energy efficient data centers, um, where, the, the, where the, the, the energy used for, heat, for cooling around the center has been now roughly cut in half recently. Um, computing vi virtualization, it's done for profit reasons, but that profit reason has led to less use of energy in this si system. We, we, we put in existing technologies and are used more frequently. Um, building installation, pool pumps, uh, 
use much less energy, you could say, oh, well, these are all insignificant. And if you say that, you got the point. There's lots of insignificant changes on their own that cumulatively have shaped the energy system. It's sort of like watching a rainstorm where every drop of rain is insignificant and you get a flood by the time it's over, and that's what energy efficiency has been. Mobility didn't change up until recently. We continue to grow. Um, Stanford energy system, I don't have time to go through this, other than it's basically an energy efficiency play. It doesn't generate electricity. It more efficiently converts electrical energy to heating and cooling. We've had behavioral nudges from O power, behavioral nudges, Energy Star encouraging both people to buy the more energy efficient appliances, but encouraging the manufacturers knowing that they could get an Energy Star appliance if they improve the fuel efi energy efficiency of their equipment, make those changes so that they can advertise it this way, and so the system of consumers and producers leading to more efficient equipment, energy use labeling um, on, on cars or, or appliances now shows the energy cost for using the system. So you now don't just look at, you now are not just looking at the first purchase price, but how much it's going to cost. Appliance labeling changes behavior of consumers. Uh, in the industrial sector, it's a long quote, but this is just a press release from DuPont, uh, uh, Titanium Technologies. The press release was they saved $100 million through energy efficiency. But I like how they said it, how they did it. No big eureka moments. Just one valve, one motor at a time, day after day. Lots of little boring stuff, which saved them $100 million. And they upgraded the hardware and software to give operators more detailed energy information so they can make better decisions in their corporation. Uh, they invented new pigments that use less energy. Those are all examples of what I was talking about. Microsoft, this is, um, thanks to Microsoft, this is the internal dashboard they use to, follow, to keep track of the building performance index of every facility in real time or in different time scales so they can know where to allocate their resources to reduce the use of energy. Companies now hire people to do that to reduce the use of, use of energy. Internal carbon prices, many companies have internal carbon prices which they then roll into the profit and loss stations, uh, statements of, of their business units, their activities, and in turn gets rolled into the profit and loss statements that evaluate managers and gets rolled into bonuses. And therefore, that gets the attention of the managers. We have decoupling of, of uh, for utilities, we've changed the incentives there. So I, I think I should end up now because I'm well over the time. But I just want to say we also have a, a equipment efficiency regulations for uh, residential, industrial. Uh, the one bad news that I see, you look at the trends in non-defense R&D, we used to spend a lot in energy R&D, and that's dwindled down to very little, and that's an error. I think that's a bad thing. So anyway, what lead, led to all of these? Actually, there's no reduced form uh, statement. It's a lot of things that work together as a system of incentives and technologies and regulations and, and human motivations that have led to energy efficiency. And you take this and say, what about going into the future? Well, recognize a healthy private sector is where a lot of the action was. And keeping the prices, the higher prices mattered. So let the prices be felt across the economy, including a carbon tax, or price that it has people recognize the impact of carbon. R&D matters. And then recognize that the market failures I started with are still there. So there's options for dealing with those two. So the bottom line is, I think if you look at the past, 
good, you know, there's, there's good, there's the bad, there's the reality. The bad is we haven't accomplished all we can. The good is that means we can accomplish more. And the other good is, boy, energy efficiency has been a dominant factor in shaping the energy system, but the least visible factor. Just leave you with one thought. If you walk past a home and they put in solar energy in there, you'll take note. You'll notice it. If, they also, if this same home didn't put in solar, but they had a light emitting diodes of homes, they insulated well, they had energy star appliances, they turned off the appliances when they're not, not in use, it would probably had at least as much impact on the energy system as the solar system. You never would have noticed it. And so that's why I think energy efficiency has been the least visible while the most important part of the energy system. And on that, I will stop. OK, one or two questions. Yes, you have it. So real quickly, does, does energy intensity versus economic dollar multiplied by 8 billion people with 2 billion of them not making a lot of money, does that keep you up at night? Meaning the projections of growing populations with a huge amount of wealth. Sure, I mean, Relative. look at, um, and we're talking about the developing world. Uh, what's happening, and it's very exciting in a lot of developing countries, is they're, they're jumping over some of the systems that we put in place in the older legacy system. Just like in cell phones, you know, they don't have a lot of telephone wires, they may have cell phones. That's happening with solar, uh, and, and uh, they're not starting with a lot of incandescent lights, they're just starting with LEDs in there. So I think that's important. But why I, that doesn't keep me up at night as much as you, one would, you should think is what I think energy efficiency is doing in the United States and around the world is it's, it's keeping the system in check so that the clean energy supply technologies can catch up. And that's what a lot of this conference has been about, those clean energy technologies that may catch up. Well, energy efficiency, keeping it in check, the system in check, allowing the rest of them to catch up, means I'm actually not so worried as one would think just using the numbers the way you described it. Yes. Yes, uh, Nazir. Yeah, I was just going to ask you if you could reflect on um, El the, import, the, um, the role of trade in energy efficiency, whether it is something that helps or does not help, and particularly uh, food, because when we go around now, we see more and more fraction of our food produced in other parts of the world and um, coming in. And, and I wonder whether someone has broken them out into a, either a contributing or a a mitigating factor? I bet somebody has. Uh, look, I, I think several things have happened. We've become more efficient in growing food, but we've used a lot more fertilizer. And that fertilizer, in many cases, is embedded hydrocarbons. And so, so those have been operating in opposite direction. Um, for the most part, the energy used to grow and harvest food is smaller than the energy used to bring it to your home. So that uh, the thing about bringing it local is you know more about the control of what you get. You, you have more confidence in what, what you're getting. But the big energy effect, I believe, but I, somebody else may look at it more carefully, is the nature of the food that's grown. For example, if you're a vegetarian, your carbon dioxide emissions in the whole chain of your food is far, far less than if you eat, eat meat all the time because of the, of the methane released from rumen and animals. So it's the nature of the food we eat and the nature of how we grow it that's much more important than how far we move it, I believe. Okay, <laughs> one more. You, Sally, your boss, to decide who left. 
Okay. Do you know how the uh, state of California is going to measure energy efficiency in buildings under the new law, SB uh, 350? I've heard double energy efficiency in buildings by 2030, and I've heard increase energy efficiency by 50%, and I've heard reduce energy use by 50%. Do you know who's going to measure it and how? <laughs> well, I've heard all those three. And, and I have never heard a consistent story. I think that, that, that I actually think what happened, but I wasn't there, is that within the governor's office, I said, what percentage should we talk? Doubling sounds like a good number. And then they announced it. And then people started asking. Diane Gunick was around here. She, she was asking very precisely. They first they said, well, we're going to be twice as efficient. We said, what does that mean? What's your benchmark? They said, oh, what we mean is, here's the growth of energy efficiency. We're going to have it twice as much. OK. And then last time I heard from a representative of the governor's office, they said, well, we're going to put in twice as much effort as we've done in the past. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer to it, that's a long answer to your question is, do you know how they're going to measure it? The short answer is nope. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm convinced that neither does the governor or any of his staff know. But what will happen is this is an implementing framework. Air Resources Board, CPUC, and the California Energy Commission will all be jointly charged with doing things that will create implementing rules. And then they're going to have to figure out what it actually means. But right now, <laughs> I'm done to find now. <laughs> okay. Any? Great. Thank you.